कभी करती हैं मुलाकातें कभी करती हैं मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती हैं बातें किताबें करती हैं बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं बातें वेलकम टू किताब नामा बुक्स एंड बियॉन्ड एवरी वीक वी ब्रिंग टू यू अव ऑथर टू टॉक अबाउट देयर राइटिंग एंड देयर बुक्स This week our guest on the show is Seher Delejani an Iranian author. Her debut novel Children of the Jacaranda Tree talks about her own birth in an Iranian prison in 1983. Thank you Seher for being on the show with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So tell us about your experiences in India before and what your association with the country is. How you felt here? It it you know there's so much in India that has to be discovered. So every time I just spend a few days but it's a continent so you know i need to sort of like divide it into tiny pieces but um i have had a great time everybody has been so kind and there's so much history and so much culture to to be discovered and seen so you know i think and i hope i get to come back many times going back to the novel could you give us the background uh, what was happening in iran in the after the revolution in the 80s well um you know in in uh, 1979 there was the um Iranian revolution and um and this was something that so i always call it the Iranian revolution not the Islamic revolution because it wasn't the Islamic part and sort of the 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 fact that it turned into a theocracy was a consequence but it was a people's revolution so there were many people involved from every political background you can possibly imagine and um in 1983 um a lot of these activists who had been involved in the revolution but did not necessarily agree to um an islamic government were arrested by the newly established islamic government and um in 1988 many of these um political prisoners who were still in prison because some of them were also released many of them were executed the number goes anything from 4000 to 12000 they were executed they were buried in mass graves and the fact that we don't know how many is exactly that that their their bodies were just dumped into these mass graves and um so it's like probably one of the biggest tragedies of post revolutionary iran and uh, my parents were both activists at the time my mom was pregnant with with me when she was arrested and um and that's where like sort of the inspiration of the book comes from um fortunately they were both released but my dad's younger brother was still in prison in 1988 and he was executed so all of these stories and this political background is what um sort of inspired me to write the book so like you said you've drawn a lot of things in the novel from your own life and from other people's real stories So where did you draw that line between fact and fiction? How did you make this a fictional novel? I have drawn on real facts, but I was interested in telling us telling stories. And uh and also I wasn't interested in writing like a biography. I wasn't interested in um only sort of um giving the idea of like look what happened to my family. I wanted to be something more than that because I think it was something more than that. I think it was a national tragedy. So I thought that I can only give voice to such national tragedy through novels, through different characters. And um so my hands are more open as well, you know. So um I for example and and there are different chapters in the book that are completely um made up. But at the same time it doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened, you know. But um So I would ask my my parents for the two chapters based in prison for details. I needed more like setting details. And um and then I would just as you write the story things happen, you know. Characters take their own lives and they do things you don't expect them to do. And what was your parents reaction to this? Were they resistant at all? 
Actually, no, I have to say I've only received support and love and um, my parents were extremely happy. Um, I think there was a sense of redemption because, you know, such um, terrible things had happened in Iran. But um, it was like that it was over, like it had happened and everybody had moved on. But it wasn't, I thought that it shouldn't be like that. And I thought that the, the memory should be kept alive. And I think for them too, there was this sense that, okay, so there was, a, we have to talk about what happened. It wasn't unimportant. And um, so, you know, so there, there, I think there is that satisfaction in that. How has the book been received in Iran? Well, um, the book is not going to come out in Iran. Um, I don't think it's going to get a permission to be, to be published in Iran. Um, but I have had, I have received many um, messages and so on from people from Iran who somehow got the book, maybe in English, I don't know. And they were all just, you know, very excited and they all thanked me. This was the message I would receive the most, like thanking me for telling this story. But the book has been, has been translated, so uh, we will eventually put it online so that the Iranians inside Iran would have access to it. Is there any writing at all on post-revolution Iran? Well, no, there are, there are many writings on, on Iranian revolution. There are many, um, a lot of them also outside of Iran. Um, writers who maybe write in English like me. Um, but I think about this particular event, the 1988 executions, there have been memoirs, um, maybe by prisoners who, you know, who were there at the time and so on, but not fiction that I know of. So, um, you know, I, I, it was interesting to, to see the reaction to, to this. How often do you go back to Iran? I used to go back quite often before um, I love, there's nothing really more beautiful for me and more fun for me than going back to Iran, we, in, in Tehran. Um, I still have family, I still have lots and lots of friends, so it's, it's really marvelous. You left when you were 12 and you did your first few years of school there. So what do you remember about it? What was the most special about your time there? Well, I was, I was 12 when I left Iran and um, so I have a, a lot of memories about my school years. I, I loved school. I was, I was quite, a, quite a nerd in some ways. I loved doing homework. I loved, I loved, I loved studying. Um, and um, I loved my teachers. And we were in an area in Tehran where it was quite a, um, it was like an Armenian Assyrian area. So it was quite Christian. And so a lot of my teachers, almost all of my teachers were Armenians or Assyrians. So I think that was, that in a way was, um, you know, for, since the beginning of you know, my education, I was in contact with the minority because I felt like a minority myself, even though I was in that, from that country. So I think in that way, I always felt in a strange, very strange way, protected as well by, by these teachers and by being surrounded by these sort of um, religious um, or you know, um, other, uh, other minorities. And, and I have really sweet memories about that. And why did you leave Iran? We left Iran in 96 um, because my mom's family had been in America for a long time, for decades. And um, we were actually the last family still in Iran. So at a certain point, my mom just wanted to join her family. She felt, I think, kind of alone. And uh, maybe also for, you know, maybe in, uh, in her mind, there was also this idea of like, you know, we would get a better education maybe in, in America and so on. And um, so we decided to leave, but it was a, uh, it had nothing to do, not so much with their political background. So I should have probably asked you this earlier, but what is the story behind the jacaranda tree? What is the symbolism behind it? Well, jacaranda tree for me is, um, it's a utopian image. Um, it's not very common in Iran. I mean, it's a tropical tree, so Iran is not a tropical country. And, um, but I always thought that there was so much beauty in this, in this um, tree, and in, in a way it, seemed to me like the Iranian revolution that you know that our parents my parents wanted it to become something so beautiful wanted the country when they when they you know had the revolution they thought it's going to be you know um, bring justice and freedom and, and and so much more and it didn't become that so it remained sort of an utopian image and um, hence the these children are that 
children of that sort of. A lot of people have noticed about the book is the strength of the women in the novel. So, I mean, is it a deliberate sort of attempt to create these strong female characters or? Definitely not. I didn't at all think that, um, I don't write, I don't start writing thinking of what kind of character I would have the character sort of comes as I, as I write. But um, I know I've, I've gotten that a lot. I think people get surprised because maybe they have a different image of Iranian women somehow, you know, more subdued or something. But for me, we're just, I was just writing about women I, I knew, women I had been surrounded with, my mothers and aunts and their friends and my grandma. And, and you know, we're talking about women who were in the front lines of a revolution. So for me to create a, a revolutionary woman wasn't just an idea that I was aspiring to. It was like what I knew. So I think many of these women are how Iranian women really are. You know? unlike what we think outside of Iran. So are you writing something at the moment? Is there going to be a second novel out soon? Yes, I am writing the second, um, my second novel. And um, it is in some ways like the second part to, to Children of the Jacaranda Tree. Um, I take some of the characters and um, sort of follow their lives and see what happens to them after their story in, in the first novel. In an interview earlier, you had said that when you were in school, you weren't allowed to talk about your parents' situation to your friends, and that created a gap between your friendships and the people that you were you know, with at that time. So tell us about that. What happened? Well, absolutely. I think it was more like um, we were in, in some ways living um, a double life. So there was this life at home where we could talk about uh, you know anything we wanted and um, my f my parents friends were mostly f people that they had met in prison so they had the same background political background and um, so there was always criticism um, of the regime and so on so I always knew that um, like we're on the other side you know we're not on the side of the government and the regime and um, but at the same time we had always been told that we should never say anything um, outside at school we should never say where our parents had been I think there was always this fear that they could go back to prison there was no reason to be in prison the first time so why not a second time and um, and also I think maybe my mom for example was worried that at school they would maybe bother us somehow or you know like um, I don't know so we were so there was always this big secret of you know, like keeping to ourselves where we, we were coming from. And um, so I never told anybody. And I think for some, for that reason, I was never really able to create really strong, um, intimate relationships with girls, with other girls my age at school. Because I was always worried that at some point I'm just going to say something, you know, that I shouldn't. So it made everything a little bit complicated. So when you were writing your novel, did you have an audience in mind? Is it more for the successive generations of the people who are involved? Is it for them to know about what happened? Well, both, you know. I mean, I, I think that when you write um, a novel, you don't really have an audience, especially if it's a first novel, and especially if you don't even know if it's going to be published. So you're kind of writing for yourself. But I know that something that was important for me was that I was going to write this as if it was in Persian as if I was writing it in Persian, even though I was writing it in English. I was trying to think that if I was in Iran and was writing this, how would I write it? That was the most important thing for me. Now, I don't know if that involved the, involves the audience or not, but that was what was important for me. So I didn't want it to be just something for the Western eye, eyes. I wanted it to be more than anything the bringing back of memory. And, um, and I think as, if it's an Iranian history we're talking about, it's as important for Iranians to know, maybe even more important, absolutely more important for Iranians to know about their own history, you know. It was very moving to hear that your mother actually found it very difficult to talk to you about these, um, you know, things in detail because when these horrific events were coming back to her, it must obviously have been hard. So how did you deal with that at that point? It's not, you know, one of her best memories, I think. So, I mean, I, I, she had always told me about it. I knew, I just didn't know the details. and I. And she had never told me in this very, you know, okay, now you speak and I write. It was more like a conversation. So when she realized that this is going to be black and white on paper, of course, everything took a different di dimension and she was a little bit, it was hard for her. So it took a few sessions for her to be able to tell me. Um, 
and I don't even know still if she's told me everything, but I, 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 I think she has the right to her, to her secrets as well. So, um, so every time she talks about it, she has nightmares and so on. But um, I thought it was important for, for this story to be out. But the funniest part is that because it was fictionalized, so I added some things, subtracted some things, and then when she reads it, she, she told me once, she's like, she said, you know, I don't even know anymore what's true and what's not. I was like, okay, so that's a triumph for me. <laughs> so lastly, I want to ask you, what do you hope to achieve, um, you know, for the, for the successive generations of the victims of this execution? Well, you know, I think, um, first of all, I think people who were involved um, with this tragedy and with these executions, I hope that one day, you know, justice, justice would be brought to them. I, I hope that there would be a trial, that, that things would be investigated. And, um, you know, in any, in, in any country when we do something bad, you know, we are, you know, or put to prison or we have to pay a fine, you know, so executions are the same thing. There has to be somebody who has to, who has to answer for it or more than one person. But of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, like, that that person is dead when when those executed are executed and they were remain executed and that's the that's the tragedy of it all. But I think another thing I would like I think it's more it's more something a little bit more symbolic, is that I would like those bodies whatever remains of those bodies to get proper burial. I think the families should be able to go to somebody's you know that my my grandma should be able to go to her son's. Um, tombstone, you know, if she wants to. And I think that the, the biggest violence um, af af after was that these families were not even um, allowed to have a funeral. They were not even allowed to mourn their loved ones that they had lost. What bigger violence than that? So I think maybe that, maybe at least that, that for, for these dead for these young, young people to, to get a proper burial and for families to be able to, to pay visit to them. Thank you so much, Sahir. That was a wonderful discussion. And thank you so much for telling us about all this, which we really didn't know about. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Time is short. For every society, there comes a moment that it must seize. That is a moment when it has a bulge in its population when there are so many very young people in it as compared to the old that it takes a giant step towards its future. In the United States, this is what was called the baby boom. The baby boom saw a vast expansion in the US's output and productivity, and equally important, a reconfiguration of its social hierarchies and values. India is going through that bulge right now, but is completely unprepared for it. And our ideas are unprepared for it as well. You see, India is unique in history. It needs to go through three transformations at the same time. The first is a demographic transition, this bulge. The second is a disruption that comes with a country building its infrastructure, connecting the dots that are people, drawing itself together. And the third is a social transformation, a turn towards modernity in our attitudes and preferences and lives. Each of these is difficult, and we have left them all for the last minute. Other countries have done one, and then the other usually. Britain built infrastructure before it liberalized its society. China was pretty liberal by the time it went through its demographic bulge, and so on. India, as usual, has chosen of its own free will to put its feet up and doze until each of those changes is underway all at the same time. Oh, and here is the final turn, the one that leaves us well and truly lost. We have to manage these three transitions while being a vibrant and diverse democracy. Who has built infrastructure while being so democratic? The rich countries of the West were oligarchies when they built their roads and railways. The tigers of the East were authoritarian. Still, if India does not catch this moment, if it does not ride this dem demographic wave, then it will be consigned to poverty and to despair forever. Almost every Indian understands this subconsciously. This is why we have expectations of the future and from our government that appear so very unreasonable. In fact, they are unreasonable, but they will have to be met anyway or social turmoil is inevitable.
perhaps you don't believe that. But the urgency, the immediacy of this need can be felt on any Indian street if you look for it. It is among the first things any visitor to India senses. She might already know, for example, that the median age in India is 25, as opposed to 34 in China, 40 in Britain, or 45 in Germany. But no statistic can convey exactly how overwhelmingly young the streets are. Once, foreigners might have noted how many people India had. Now they will note, in addition, how very young most of them are too. I too, when I moved back to India from the United States in 2007, reflected morosely that I was moving from a country where I was below the average height to one where I was above the average age. Young people stand out in another way too. They are visibly taller and healthier than their parents. Far more of them can read and write. In 1991, when the economy began to open up, India's literacy rate was 43%. Today, it is 74%. The three quarters of Indians under 30 do not remember the distant past that shaped the rest of us, that dull beige India that state socialism had born, when incomes barely grew, food was always short, and there was nothing on TV but information for farmers. For the rest of us, the speed of the transformation has been blinding. For them, it is still too slow. And perhaps it is too slow. One of the most stunning numbers in a country that specializes in mind-numbing numbers is this. 13 million Indians will join the workforce every year from now until 2030. They know their prospects are not good. Here is why. Because in the years from 1970 to 1983, not celebrated as a time of overwhelming prosperity, the total number of jobs in the economy nevertheless grew 2.3% a year. In the years between liberalization in 1991 and today, Jobs have grown at an average of only 1.6% a year. But if these young people have to be absorbed, then jobs must grow at 3% a year, twice the rate at which they're growing right now. This is simply not happening. In other words, one out of every two youngsters who starts looking for a job next year will not find one. Here is the last terrifying figure. According to the last census, 47 million Indians under the age of 25 are already looking for regular work, but not finding it. That's right. At this moment, there is an army of angry young unemployed men in India that numbers as much as the total population of Spain or Kenya or South Korea. And that number will grow by 6 million every year at least. That is asking for trouble, no? Go today to a small Indian town. There are only three places where you see vibrant activity, cues, discussion, energy. <clears throat> One is the alcohol shop. The second is a news agent who also sells application forms for public sector jobs. And the third is a guy who sells lottery ticket. This tells its own story of desperation and of hope.